Right, so we're going to go into how do we define the marketing funnel and ROI measurement. I'm going to talk about the front end stuff. And then Sheldon is the technical guy, so he will be talking about the back end stuff. When we look at marketing funnel, with the funnel starting at the top, with awareness, driving down to the bottom via discovery, then consideration, then going into a conversion. We call it at Nitra, we say this is the traditional funnel, you know, everything falls, it's like kind of just like magically falling down into a conversion, which we all know isn't, isn't the case. Um, so we actually turn it upside down. You actually need to work quite hard to get to that final conversion. So you're going against gravity um, and we need to consider the full user journey with micro and macro conversions. So by understanding the full user journey, you uh, accurately calculate your marketing efforts and your ROI. At the bottom, you'll see in yes, um, so we've got like four levels and those are the micro conversions. And then we work our way to the macro, which is the ultimate conversion um, that, that we're working towards. So just to put this in a practical um, example, this is how we like to also visualize um, the KPIs from a perspective. So you'll see starting at the bottom, we've got the site traffic. So looking at our um, sessions, our views, engage rate, and then also bounce rate. So that is what happens on the site. So all the site traffic. Then going into a level up is the site engagement. So people that download a file or people that goes onto the menu and click inquire. Then we know we're going a step further. So there's real consideration. So people are actually narrowing down into a conversion, um, which we then call a micro conversion. So this is really just before the ultimate conversion. Um, and that can be anything like a phone click, a login, or a subscription. And then at the top, where we're all wanting to work towards, we've got our ultimate KPI. Um, it can be a, a sale, an attendance, a registration to a webinar, like it would be for uh, for Nitra. Um, anything that that you are ultimately working towards for your company. Um, so here we you can see the funnel going up, and it's very concentrated, um, and we know what we are working towards. And it is very important that we actually compare the performance. So we need to know what is working. So you can either look at month on month, year on year, um, any comparison to the same time period that uh, the, for the period that you are reporting on, uh, just to know, you know, gauge where we are going in terms of performance and also to know what is working and what isn't working. I think I just want to add that the, the funnel doesn't necessarily have to have less steps as you go up. I mean, you can see between mm. the bottom step and the second bottom step, it's only two for in site engagement. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a funnel in terms of building blocks, but it's just a visualization to know that there's a step in between that you do, you do need to get through. So just going into the stuff that happens before a lead or a sale, fancy name, micro conversion. How do we determine what is a micro conversion on your site? We need to apply our logic. It's very much, it's, it's easy. We can all do it. It's just literally just a sitting down, um, having a bit of focus time, apply your logic. Don't overthink it. You sit and you follow the user journey as you would put yourself in your, um, in your customer's shoe. And then you document the user interactions. So each site and each client's website is obviously different and unique, but you are the person that understands your website and your product the best. There might be a few journeys, um, they might just be one, it might be simple, it might be complicated. It's really what do users do in the buying cycle before they convert. I used uh, Kiro just as a show and tell. I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, with the school. They've got um, quite a few schools over Southern Africa, and this is what the website looks like. If we think about conversions, we automatically go, it's a contact me or the apply now. 
Now that is seen as the macro conversion. That's what we're working towards. And we need to know what happens before the macro conversion. And that is known as the micro conversion. Now, as mentioned previously, there, there are a few signals and we call it like soft buying signals that you need to take into consideration before people reach that macro conversion. For the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to use Finder School as a, a micro conversion. So just now putting myself into a parent's shoes, I am going to click on find a school. I'm going to follow the user journey and I get to, to this bar and I can either do a quick search or a manual search. I click on manual search. It takes me to various school options that are close by. I look at building blocks pre-primary school and I want to learn more. So I click on that and then I'm interested. So I'm going to, I'm going to either click on call me or apply now. And that is the macro conversion. But that is the whole user journey that we're following. That is giving us the soft buying signals. So what a user does when they follow that journey, that is essentially the micro conversions. To put that into the buying cycle, into the upside down funnel, uh, we visualized it so that you can see the full picture. So going from off-site back onto on-site, um, we're starting at the bottom. So I need to enroll my kid to a school and I see ads on Google ads. So maybe some display ads. I see nice ads on Meta. So be it Facebook or Instagram. And then I'm like, okay, cool. Going into the consideration phase, Kira looks inter interesting. So I go and search for it, click on it. I'm like, okay, cool, nice, want to know more, go on to a quick tour, go, no, they really, they've got my, they've got my attention, and I'm like, okay, cool, but which one, which one would be best suited, so I go and find a school, and I'm like, okay, lacquer, this is where I want to go, and I say either contact me or apply now, and that's the macro conversion. So that is just giving using Curo as an example for the buying cycle, seeing how do you plot it? How do you? Um... I think what's what, what we're trying to, to communicate is a lot of clients that we've noticed is they don't get leads and they don't get sales. And they're like, I don't understand why not. Like what's mm -hmm. happening? And this is the window and this is the process you have to follow to sort of see what's breaking yes. in the process. So, so that's, that's what we've seen with, 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 with our clients. Nice thing is so you can track it. So you can actually start seeing, you know, I'm not getting uh, leads or sales, but actually people are taking a quick tour and maybe that functionality is great or maybe it's not great. So then you can, know, then you know where it sort of breaks down. Exactly. Thanks Fabi. And yeah, it's, um, and that's also where the, comparison um, on the previous periods comes in quite handy. So you need to know, like, why is it down 20%? Uh, like, I, there's, there's a problem. It's um, like maybe need to di uh, dive a bit deeper, do a bit of troubleshooting, or, you know, maybe it's doing incredibly well. So we know, okay, this area is working well. We don't need to focus on it. And it's really just to to drill down, to make it easier for you to understand and determine when you need to focus your, your efforts. Um, and I think the biggest part of this, so firstly, understanding the, the buying cycle, the micro-macro conversions, but then it doesn't mean anything if you're not tracking it, right? So we need to know the data behind it. That's where the specialist, uh, Mr. Analytics, Mr. Panda comes in. Okay, cool. So, so we've covered the front end part. Now we're going into the back end. Like Danae said, we obviously need to be able to track our, in our interaction. So we are going to focus on GA4. Uh, everybody is interested in it, so let's talk about it. There are four types of events in GA4. There's automatically collected events, which are your default ones. There's enhanced measurement, which is um, a feature that allows you to use GA4 without making any coded 
I've got examples for all of these. Uh, without making any code changes, there's recommended events. So Google's giving you the best practices. Now we've got those for you. And then custom events, which I think uh, a lot of people are interested in. So let's get mm. Okay, so you automatically collected events by default. Uh, events that are sent to GA4, when you install your tracking code in your app, or when you insert your tracking code in your website, on your website. Um, these include first open, so that's specifically for apps. So that's the first time a user opens your app. Uh, first visit, so if a user visits the website for the first time, you get a specific event for that. There's a page view event, so that one's got a little asterisk next to it, just because it can be tracked or not tracked, depending on what you need. So it's just, um, it's got a little note there. Screen view is for apps, so every time a page loads in your app. Um, session start is for both. So the first time or when a user starts interacting with your platform, you'll get a session start. And then user engagement is a generic event that Google's given you for free um, that gives you some information. They're still building it out, but it is there. It doesn't cost you anything to use or to have, but it's just there. Yes, Bryce. There was that first click, right, for the first time that someone had come on a website. Well, Google Analytics filter out that th this whole journey was an initial journey for this person and will it put that in their own category so that when we go look back, we can see that these are all the new users and this was their typical journey first time on the site. Yep. So what that would be, it would be a segment in your reports where your user has their first visit or their first open. So yeah, you can, you can filter it based on that. It's actually mm -hmm. what the term you used of new users, that's exactly what Google uses to determine a new user in a session. Then enhanced measurement. So this, the, these are events that you can switch on and off without making any code changes. It's really, really interesting that Google gave this facility um, on the tracking code, which is really nice. So you can track page views, scroll. So if you want to know how far users scroll on your website, if they're going to the bottom, um, how far down, you get a specific event for that. If there's an outbound click, so a click that leads away from your domain, it's triggered and it triggers an outbound click. Site search, so if, um, going back to the Cure example, you can then track what words users are typing in the search bar with GA4. Um, so if, for example, if you're searching for Randberg or if you're searching for Joe Bergman, whatever that is, um, you can get a report in GA4 that then allows you to see what users are searching for to give better responses to them. Then there's video engagement. So this one has a little asterisk next to it, but I didn't put it. It's mainly for YouTube videos that are embedded. So it'll give you a report on when reports, when a video is started, progress through it, so your percentages, and then when a video is complete. File downloads. So if you have PDFs or if you have brochures on your website, Google will allow you to automatically collect that information based on the fact that it's a PDF file, for example. Then there's form start and form submit. So knowing the difference between that's actually very important to know how many people start the form and how many people actually complete the form. Uh, it's two different events that you need to know. Yeah, so I think uh, just, just on that one specifically, um, the the importance to know with, uh, between form start and form submit is if you see there's a lot of drop off, you know there's, there's, um, there's something that's, uh, that you might need to investigate or maybe make it a bit more user friendly or there's something that you need to troubleshoot. Then recommended events. So these are events that Google recommends everyone should consider using. It's also a nice starting point um, for determining what could be your micro and your macro conversion. So ad impression is um, specifically for publishers. So if you have inventory on your site, you can trigger an event to track that in GA4. Earn virtual currency, that's very specific to gaming, uh, gaming apps. They generate lead. So this one, I think we've highlighted the ones we think are super important for you to consider. So generate lead is if a person fills out the form and wants to be called back. Um, there's login. So if, you are, if your site allows functionality for a login process, it's very important to know how many people are actually using it. And the reason for that is like a practical, practical example is if you can segment your audience or your users into users who've logged in, you probably, it probably means they're existing customers. So you can probably stop advertising your awareness to them, but rather do consideration or lower or upper funnel uh, <laughs> um, marketing towards them. Then purchase, same logic. So if you want to know what channels are bringing valuable traffic to your site, using something like a purchase event is really useful. And then sign up as well. So if you offer a newsletter or another soft conversion point, that's really useful for you to consider. Chantal? 
Um, what's the difference between the search on the automatically corrected events and then the one that you had now on recommended events? Because one I think was site search and the other one was search. So it's actually up to you. So the site search okay. event is um, specifically for site search, which allows where you'd filter the content of your own website. You could also have search where you could search between sizes or different elements of a product. So like if you wanted a blue one versus a red one and someone can search for that. Okay, so this could be a more specific search. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. a good question. That's a very good question. Thank you. Then we've also got a list here. Um, if you have sales or if you offer e-commerce functionality and you've also got your events for games. So if there are any game developers on here, these are probably the events you'd want to use. The main one you'll see that's across um, for both is purchase because obviously you do want to track that. That's a macro event either way. Then we've got custom events. So these are events specifically for your business and they can be as granular as you want. Um, I've got the example here for sign up for a newsletter versus signing up for weekly specials. So let's say you were a shop and you offered um, specific sales on a weekly basis and then you had a monthly newsletter. You could trigger the difference between um, which one users are more interested in and then track that. There's viewer brochure, downloading a brochure, um, someone who's watched three videos. So this is a very specific one um, that I've actually seen quite often is one video watched is cool, but having multiple videos consumed is actually more valuable to you. So having that as an explicit event makes your audience building a lot easier. They submitted a quote and upload a document. In this day and age where we don't need to go to a bank or you don't need to go get certified or your FICA documents need to be uploaded. Having an uploaded documents event is actually very useful. To know that a person started an application and then didn't get to the end, but they didn't do the uploaded documents event might be something's wrong with the uploaded documents. Mm. So that you can see is a very specific example, but it is very specific to that business and will add a lot of value. Cool. And then this is just me putting a little bit of disclaimers on things. You can have up to 500 uniquely named app events per day. So what that means is if you have an app and you're tracking every single interaction, you can only have 500 uni unique ones per day. It's just there so that you don't have a high cardinality in your reports. What that means is that if you go and you pull a number of events, you want to have it as broad but as specific as possible which I, I realize that is a very strange thing to say, but you do want to have them grouped together so that you don't have to go at a very granular level to, to choose your, your, your events for your reporting. And then every event name needs to have a 40 character limit. That's just a, it's a backend limitation. They don't allow for events to have more than 40 characters. And then 25 parameters allowed. So that is any information you want to add onto your event to make it more specific to you, you're allowed to have 25 different custom parameters added on. Yeah, into the online ROI. Hopefully all familiar with uh, the calculation on ROI. All right, Sheldon, Sheldon put a nice uh, little explanation there. So looking at your return um, sub and you subtract your investment. So the revenue or the sales that you made um, and you take minus the media or the marketing spend or whatever the case may be that you put behind it divided by your investment and you times it by 100. And that's basically the ROI that you get. Sheldon is going to go into how we're going to do the online via, uh, via GA4 now. We just spoke about um, tracking events and tracking conversions. So you obviously need to choose the ones that are the most valuable to you. You can track, you can track and assign values to all of them, but just choose the ones that are the most important to get started with. Once you have that, you need to assign a value. So it can be your actual sales value. It can be an average sale value. It can even be a placeholder. The objective and the reason for assigning a value is so that you can compare them to other events. That is the main reason. If you don't have your, your actual sale value right now, that's fine. You can start with something as simple as a one and a two. And I've got other examples there. Once you have a value assigned to it, you can quantify whether it's worth it or not. And that's where your ROI reporting comes in. Cool. So like I said, assigning values. If you have sales, you can use your e-commerce value. That'll be the perfect one to use. It's the exact value that you're getting from your, your investment. You can also do value from an order. So if you have the quantity and the price, it doesn't need to be an e-commerce implementation. It can literally be, I mean, we've got people using paper. Excel still the one, paper and pen still good. Um, your quantity and your price, that's all you need. 
You can also use it for a specific product value. So if you know, if you have 10 products, for example, and each of them have a different price, we can show you how to use a lookup table in GTM to send that specific value when that specific product is sold. Or if someone requests um, a quote on a specific product, we can help you with that. There's also estimated value. So this one is, is really fun to do, is if you know your average sale value is 1,000 Rand and you need five quotes to get one sale, it means your quote event is actually worth 200 Rand. That, that, that is simple maths, but it's actually super powerful knowing if you get 10, 10 quote events, you're probably going to have two sales. Like that's, that's literally what's going to happen. Then there's a relative placeholder value. This one is a little bit more subjective. You can have one conversion event which, which is worth more than another. So for example, a call me back could be worth 10, while a newsletter is worth two. Completely up to you. If you have these metrics, that's really cool. Um, and you can assign them as you need. It's just to quantify an event. That's all this is. That's all this is trying to do. Um, and then just a note, when doing this, something I got caught out with at the beginning of GA4, it needs to be added as a metric, not a custom dimension. That's just for free. In GA4, um, there's something called the explore section, which is where you build majority of your reports now. Um, and there's a report for revenue. So you can add your source. Can't see me moving my mouse. Um, you have your column one, which is your source and your medium, so where your traffic is coming from. If you have campaigns, that's really cool. You can have that as well. And then in GA4, by default, we, we're using the purchase or, or the revenue number. So from each of those channels, so line two is Google Organic, $36,000 came from that one. Uh, line five is Google CPC. There's a specific campaign name there. That generated $2,500 worth of revenue. This is out of the Google Merchant um, Store. That's we, We're happy to share these numbers. If you are using Google Ads, there is a native integration. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you guys have linked your Google Ads to your GA4 already. You can then see your Google Ad campaign against what revenue is being generated once you have this value. Just to reiterate, we are using total revenue, but if you are assigning a metric or a placeholder, you can then swap out that value into this report, which will then allow you to see your Google Ads cost against that metric of whatever you decided to use. Then understanding your cost and investment. So it's easy to say Google Ads cost us X amount because you can see that number. Something to also include is if you have a referral program or an affiliate network that's sending traffic to your site, there is a cost to that. You can also include that in this calculation. In addition, your emails. So if you are sending out a newsletter, you can take into account how much the content for that email costs you, how much the platform costs you. All of that can be a monthly cost that you can still then show ROI against, which is really powerful if you're trying to get more budget for more content or for a better email system. I don't know. And to understand the performance of the channel. Yeah. Top tips for online only. So if you are sending traffic from various sources, make sure that if you aren't, if it's not Google Ads, you should be using some sort of UTM tracking. What that is is source medium campaign. You specify the value so that when the traffic hits your website or your app, um, well, it's actually mainly for your website, you can then see where it came from. Uh, a very big thing with doing this is doing the 80-20 rule. Super important. Yes. Super. You don't need to do everything all at once, but do majority of what you want to track and then go start somewhere. Yes. Super important. Uh, any questions so far? You, you mentioned the value earlier. So a lot of some people use lead scoring because you don't get the sale online, but you get mm -hmm. leads. So... Would you like just to sign like a lead score? So that's usually like 20 or 40 or 60. So if somebody clicks on this thing, the lead score is 10. If something somebody subscribes to this newsletter, it's worth 30. And if they complete a lead form, it's like worth 100. Is that sort of what you meant by that? 100% correct. So the nice thing about sending the value of or assigning a value to an event is that you can also use it to build audiences. So let's say you've got, um, like Ferdy's using the example, they click a certain button or they fill out a form. You can advertise to those users who've reached a certain score. So mm -hmm. maybe they've filled out, um, they've downloaded two PDFs and watched one video and that score brings them to 20. You could then target users who've got a score of 20. That's also something you can do. And that's really super powerful. So, so, so going back to the Kira thing is, so if somebody goes browse school, or look for schools that that puts them as a qualified like visitor and in theory that's an audience so it means that you can then take that data that audience push it to google ads and then really hit those hard and pay a lot of money for those yeah. to just make yeah. sure that you 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 reach them 
But even a step further is you add that parameter saying which school it is that they looked at, and then you hit them with an ad relevant to that school that they were looking at, um, so that okay. it is relevant advertising. Uh, Chantel, go. Okay, I don't know. This is more like a, a ads question than the Google Analytics one, um, but like we have a. It's not a cheap product, but I mean, it's not like a school registration. And we did some testing with um, Google ads and Facebook ads. And for us, we found out like the, I want to say cheaper products because it's between like 80 to 1,000 and, but we found better conversions in terms of people actually making sales versus the um, Google ads. So, um, and then it's also like how, because there's so many various touch points online, how do you actually find out? Is it because you know people saw it on Google Ads, but then the conversion actually happened on social media? You know, so it's not necessarily that Google Ads is not working for you. It's just a different point in the user journey. Like how how do you take that complete user journey um, to really get valuable insights and not just like oh you know Google Ads is not working. Let's just put more media behind social. Yeah, oh, you're asking the best questions. Um, so yes, it's a question of attribution. So we cannot look at a channel in a silo. Um, they each have an effect um, and they each have, it's like a domino effect, but also not. It's interplay. It's interplay, they're all connected, um, but we don't always see that that connection. Um, and it's, it's a question of, having that attribution to your channels and having um, all the data in play and connected. Um, and we're actually going to, to touch on that attribution um, now, yeah. almost. Okay. Um, so, so hopefully that answers your question, but Chantal, we'll take that into consideration when, when we're going through that slide now. But okay. great. Chantal, you're not the only one at this problem. Yeah, so no, it's, it's a universal, it's a universal <laughs> thing. Okay, thank you. So. We've spoken about valuing engagement. Um, so the big part that changes here between online and offline is for an offline event, you need something linked to the user or to a campaign. So what that means is you need to know when the sale happens offline or when your conversion happens offline. It needs to either be linked to something that came from online, be it the campaign, be it the user's cookie, be it a user ID if you have that set up. And once you have that linked, you can then assign the value in your spreadsheet. I mean, this is an easy example. It can be done offline in a spreadsheet. Um, the process I'm going to show now is actually done by a, a spreadsheet. And then once you do that, you just upload it into GA4. Google's made this a lot easier, thankfully. Uh, it's a super powerful function that once you know how to do it and is if it's regularly done, will add a lot more value to your reports. So what the function is, it's data import. You, the term is used in GA3. It's now a bigger part in GA4. You can upload cost data, item data, user data, and offline events. So the cost data I'm just going to touch on because it's actually really interesting that third-party, non-Google, i.e. Meta, so Facebook and Instagram, um, you can upload the how much you spend on those channels or on that platform into GA4. And the amazing part about that is to basically Chantal's question is that if you're spending on another channel, you need to include it in your in your ROI. You can't just exclude it from any of your reports. The, the really interesting part is that you can do it by day. So if you know on a specific day you spent a lot of money on a specific campaign, um, like you had a launch or something, you could then input that specific data point into GA4 and it will link it to all the conversions that may have come from it. Um, the Example for cost data is you need a campaign ID. So like I said, you need some sort of identifier. You need the source, so whether it was Facebook or Twitter, the medium, the date, how many impressions, how many clicks, and how much cost or what your spend was. And you need to do this via spreadsheets. It's literally, there's a there's a See, there's a place for spreadsheets. There's a place for spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> and once you upload it, it literally takes about 24 to 48 hours, depending on how much data is going through your account. And then this will start appearing next to your campaign data in traffic. So you'll then be able to say, on a certain day, we spent X amount on Facebook and we got X amount from X amount of users and sessions on the website. 
Then offline sales. So this one is a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's also the reason why I have a job. <laughs> it is, um, what you need to do is upload a spreadsheet. And you can see this example is quite a, quite more, a, a lot more extensive here at the bottom. But basically, you tell GA4, a purchase occurred from this user on this date. That's all you need to do with the value. And once you have all of those things, you can see there's a couple parameters that's, that's listed there. But essentially, you can create a fake event that you tell GA4, this event is essentially a conversion that happened outside of your view. This is what happened. This is who did it. And I, I want to track it against um, the data I have already. An important part is that it needs to be done within 72 hours of an event. So what that means is if you do regular uploads, you shouldn't have this problem. But if you do a, a batch upload once a month, you'll then see a spike once a month on, a, on the day that you did it that all your sales happened. Daily because is ideal. Daily is ideal. So why are we saying daily is ideal? Because then if you have that information in your analytics platform, um, you can actually use that for ROAS bidding um, in media platform for activation. So if you only do it once a month, then it's going to skew the data. Then it looks like one day did massive sales and the other day did nothing. So it makes it actually usable in terms of activating your data in the media platforms. But now that we know all of this, um, so uh, what does the marketing funnel look like? Um, how do we calculate online ROI? How do we calculate offline ROI? Now imagine we've got everything um, set up in an ideal world. And um, even if we just start small, what do we do with the data? How do we know if we're performing well? So we need to benchmark. And how we do that is you look at your own data. You need to make sure that you collect your data, you're collecting your micro and your macro conversions, so you've got that full picture of the user journey. You need to report on it, visualize it and keep it simple. Um, and then also very um, important when you analyze it, so you keep on monitoring the performance, but you need to compare the data. So are we doing better than the previous period? Are we doing worse? Is there something like a red flag popping up? Um, which will bring you into the activation of the data. So you need to put that into your strategy and improve. So the data will tell you where you need to focus your efforts. So if you see in the funnel, there's a massive red flag. It might be, I don't know, a website issue. There might be a UX issue, device Com issues, compatibility. compatibility, speed. Like there's lots of... Lots of things that you can consider, but um, your data will will uh, will bring this up and show you where you need to investigate. The, the focus area for this uh, for this piece today wasn't necessarily around activation, but I think it's very important for us to just emphasize the fact that it should not be discounted. The activation of your data is where the golden strategy, where that magic lies. So if you've got all the data and you know what is working, what isn't working, and you activate accordingly, you're going to minimize media wastage. You are going to have relevant targeting to relevant clients at the right time. Um, it's just going, you're going to be so much more effective with your data and within the business as well, driving those ultimate goals and objectives. Okay, cool. So what this is, this is a channel report in GA4. It is literally a default report uh, that shows you if you've got your conversion set up, if you've got your ads costs or your, your linked Google ads, and if you are using a cost import, you can then get that second column that says ad costs. It'll then show you your cost per conversion. If you have your revenue or your metric for measuring the value of your events, um, you can then get a return on ad spend. This is a report which I think if everybody showed this to whoever was signing off budget, you could then prove the value of that channel. Mm. To Chantal's point, there is another uh, section which I, I wish we had added on here is this model comparison. You know, if you look on the on the left side, um, that shows you your data driven attribution. Uh, we'll add the slide in um, to the deck before we share it. But basically what that'll do, it'll show you the different channels and how they influenced your conversion like the, the likelihood that a conversion would take place, mm -hmm. as well as if there is revenue or cost associated, how that is impacted by those different channels. So an example of that would be if a user
clicked a Facebook ad, they came from social, and then did a search and then converted. Technically, both of those should get 50% of the credit. That's what it can show you. Mm. Uh, that's a really easy, stupid example, but that's what this sort of reporting can show you. The biggest part, and just going back to the top tip, making sure that everything is UTM tagged or tagged correctly will make this possible. If you are putting poor or low quality data into GA4, you're not going to get the results you want. Yeah. Say bye to everybody. Bye, everybody. Ciao. <laughs>